Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2023. Welcome to lesson number four, ready for teaching on April 22. The author is Pastor Mark Finlay and your reader is Dr. Percy Harold. This lesson is from the series Three Cosmic Messages and our lesson title is Fear God and Give Glory to Him. Sabbath afternoon, April 15. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you as sinful human beings. We come to you as people who need salvation. And we also come to you as people who are looking forward to that day when Jesus will come. And as we study about that this week, as we study about the end times, as we study about the message that needs to go to every part of the world, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be here to guide us, to bless us and to cleanse us. We also thank you that wherever we are in this world, we have this opportunity of studying your word. And today I'd like to pray for people who are listening in various parts of the world. There are those who are suffering with loss of vision or are unable to read for whatever the reason. But many of us listen to your word each week because In it we see and hear what your word says to us. And I'd like to pray for those who are listening in Wellington, New Zealand, in Toowoomba, Australia. Uh, I'd like to pray for Jose Villanona from the Dominican Republic and Brother O'Neill from Jamaica and also Marie Edwards from the same place and Veta from Northville in Michigan and Thelma Ray from St Thomas and Mathiro from Malawi in Africa for M. Kramer in Utah for Edward Mink in Wabag, Papua New Guinea and for Jockson in New Zealand. Lord, wherever we're listening, wherever we're studying your word together, we pray that We will be blessed and that your name will be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our memory text this week is Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Let's read that again. Revelation 14 verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Danish author Søren Kierkegaard told a parable about the end time. It went something like this. A fire broke out backstage in a big theatre. A clown, who had been part of the performance, came out to warn the audience. Get out! The place is on fire! The audience thought it was a big joke, part of the show. That's all, and just applauded. He repeated the warning, get out, get out. But the more emphatically he warned them, the greater the applause. For Kierkegaard, that is how the world is going to end. That is, to the general applause of wits who believe it's a joke. The end of the world and events leading up to it are, as we know, no joke. The world faces the most serious crisis since the flood. In fact, Peter himself uses the story of the flood as a symbol of the end, warning that just as the world of old perished by water, in the end times, as it says in 2 Peter 3.10, the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Having been warned about what is coming, we now need to be prepared for it as well. Sunday, April 16. Fear God. The purpose of the book of Revelation for our generation is to prepare a people to be ready for Jesus' soon return and to unite with him in giving his last day message to the world. Revelation reveals the plans of God and unmasks the plans of Satan. It presents God's final appeal, his urgent, eternal, universal message for all humanity. Read the Apostle John's urgent end-time appeal in Revelation 14 verse 7 
We'll also have a look at Genesis 22.12, Psalm 89.7, Proverbs 2 verse 5, Ecclesiastes 12 verses 13 and 14, and Ephesians 5 verse 21. What specific instruction does John give us? First of all, Revelation 14 verse 6, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. And Genesis chapter 22 verse 12, And He said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Psalm 89 verse 7, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. Proverbs 2 verse 5 Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And Ecclesiastes 12 verses 13 and 14 Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. And Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21, which says just simply, submitting to one another in the fear of God. What specific instruction does John give us? Well, the Greek New Testament word for fear in Revelation 14 verse 7 is phobio. P-H-O-B-E-O. It is used here not in the sense of being afraid of God, but in the sense of reverence, awe and respect. It conveys the thought of absolute loyalty to God and full surrender to His will. It is an attitude of mind that is God-centred rather than self-centred. It is the opposite of Lucifer's attitude in Isaiah 14 verses 13 and 14 when he says in his heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. Instead, it is the attitude of Christ, who, though, as it says in Philippians 2, 6 and 8, being in the form of God, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. The essence of the great controversy revolves around submission to God. Lucifer was self-centred. He refused to submit to any authority except his own. Rather than submit to the one upon the throne, Lucifer desired to rule from the throne. Put simply, to fear God is to place Him first in our thinking. It is to renounce our self-centeredness and pride and to live a life wholly for Him. And it obviously must be important because it's the first of the words out of the mouth of the first angel of the three. Hence, we must take heed. So to finish today, what has been your own experience of fearing God? How would you explain to someone in a positive way why the fear of God is something good? Monday, April 17, Fearing and Obeying God What else does the Bible teach us about what it means to fear God? Read Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 2, Psalm 119 verses 73 and 74, and Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verses 13 and 14. What do these texts reveal is the result of fearing God? First of all, Deuteronomy 6 verse 2, That you may fear the Lord your God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you, and your son and your grandson, 
all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. And Psalm 119, beginning at verse 73, Your hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Those who fear you will be glad when they see me, because I have hoped in your word. And Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. These passages reveal a linkage between fearing God and keeping his commandments. Fearing God is an attitude of reverential respect that leads us to obedience. Heaven's urgent appeal is for those saved by grace to be obedient to God's commands. For Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 to 10 reads, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Grace does not free us from obeying the commands of God. The gospel sets us free from the law's condemnation, not from our responsibility to obey it. Grace not only delivers us from the guilt of our past, but it also empowers us to live godly, obedient lives in the present. The Apostle Paul declares that we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations in Romans 1 verse 5. There are some people who have the strange idea that salvation by grace somehow negates the law of God or minimises the necessity for obedience. They believe that any talk about obedience is legalism. They have declared, all I want is Jesus. The question is, which Jesus? A Jesus of our own making or the Jesus of Scripture? The Christ of Scripture never leads us to downplay his law, which is the transcript of his character. The Christ of Scripture never leads us to minimise the doctrines of the Bible, which reveal more clearly who he is and his plan for this world. The Christ of Scripture never leads us to reduce his teaching to pious platitudes that are non-essential. Christ is the embodiment of all doctrinal truth. Jesus is truth incarnated. He is doctrine lived out. Revelation's final appeal calls us through faith in Jesus to accept the fullness of everything he offers. It calls us to fear God, which is expressed by faith in his redeeming power, to empower us to live godly, obedient lives. So, to finish today, how do Jesus' words here, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell, in Matthew 10, 28, help us understand what it means to fear God? Tuesday, April 18, Living a God-Centred Life In an age of consumerism, when secular values have made self the centre, heaven's appeal is to turn from the tyranny of self-centredness and the bondage of self-inflated importance to place God at the centre of our lives. For some, money is the centre of their lives. For others, it is pleasure or power. For some it may be sports, music or entertainment. Revelation's message is a clarion call to fear, respect and honour God as life's true centre. Read Matthew chapter 6 verse 33, Colossians 3 verses 1 and 2 and Hebrews 12 1 and 2. What do these passages tell us about making God the true centre of our lives? Matthew 6.33 But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Colossians 3 verses 1 and 2 If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. 
Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. And Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The central issue in earth's final conflict is a battle for the mind. It really is one of allegiance, authority and commitment to God's will. The final battle in the great controversy is between good and evil for control of our thoughts. The Apostle Paul gives us this admonition in Philippians 2 verse 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. The mind is the citadel of our being. It is the wellspring of our actions. The word let means to allow or to choose. It speaks of a volitional act of the will. The choice to have the mind of Christ is the choice to allow Jesus to shape our thinking by filling our minds with the things of eternity. Our actions reveal where our thinking process is. To fear God is to make him first in our lives. Think about how easy, in one sense, it is to control your thoughts, at least when you are conscious that you need to control them. Often, the problem is that unless we make a conscious effort to dwell on the right things, the things above, not things on the earth, as it says in Colossians 3 verse 2, our minds, fallen and sinful as they are, will naturally tend toward the base things, the things of the world. Hence, we need to, as Paul said, purposely and deliberately choose, using the sacred gift of free will, to dwell on the heavenly things. And so, to finish the day, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 reads, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. How do we learn to do what Paul tells us here? Wednesday, April 19. Giving Glory to God the study of the use of the phrase in the Old Testament to give glory to God, as it reads in Revelation 14 verse 7, shows that, interestingly enough, often, but not only, appears in the context of divine judgment. As we read in Joshua 7, 1 Samuel 6, Jeremiah 13 and Malachi 2, just as it does in the first angel's message as well in Revelation 14, verse 7. Let's look at those verses. Joshua 7, 19 reads, Now Joshua said to Achan, My son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession to him, and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 5, Therefore, you shall make images of your tumours and images of your rats that ravage the land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand from you, from your gods and from your land. And Jeremiah 13, verses 15 and 16. Hear and give ear. Do not be proud, for the Lord has spoken. Give glory to the Lord your God, before he causes darkness, and before your feet stumble on the dark mountains, and while you are looking for light. He turns it into the shadow of death, and makes it dense darkness. And Malachi chapter 2, verse 2. And if you will not hear, and if you will not take it to heart, to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already, because you do not take it to heart. 
And then in Revelation 14.7 we read, Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. This idea is seen too in Revelation 19 verses 1 and 2 which read, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honour and power belong to the Lord our God, for true and righteous are His judgments. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 16 and 17, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 and 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31. How do these passages help us understand one way that we can glorify God? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at verse 16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. According to the Apostle Paul, our bodies are a sanctuary, the dwelling place of the Spirit of God, a temple made holy by the presence of God. The Scriptures give us a clarion call to glorify God in every aspect of our lives. When God is the centre of our lives, our one desire is to give glory to Him, whether through our diet, our dress, our entertainment or our interaction with others. We give glory to God as we reveal His character of love to the world through our commitment to doing His will. This is even more important in the light of earth's end-time judgment. Read Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. What appeal does the Apostle Paul make regarding the totality of our life choices? Romans 12, beginning at verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren... By the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The New Testament Greek word for bodies in this passage is somata, S-O-M-A-T-A, which is better translated the collective sum of who you are, body, mind and emotions. The Phillips translations of the Bible translates the expression reasonable service as an act of intelligent worship. In other words, when you make a total commitment to fear God and glorify Him in all you do, giving your mind, body and emotions to Him, this is an act of intelligent worship. And too, in light of God's judgment, taking heed to obey is indeed a good idea. And so to finish today, think about what you do with your body. What can you do to make sure that you are indeed glorifying God with it? Thursday, April 20, Revelations Overcomers Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, we read in Revelation 14 verse 12. This is the depiction of God's faithful people in the last days. Yet, the only way anyone can keep the commandments of God then or now is through the faith of Jesus. Notice our text does not say faith in Jesus, although that is extremely important, but this expression, the faith of Jesus, is something more. It is the quality of faith that enabled Christ to be victorious over Satan's fiercest temptations. Faith is a gift given to each believer. When we exercise the faith that the Holy Spirit puts in our heart, that faith grows. 
We overcome not by our willpower, but by the power of the living Christ working through us. We overcome not because of who we are, but because of who He is. We can overcome because He overcame. We can be victorious because He was victorious. We can triumph over temptation because He triumphed over temptation. Read Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16 and Hebrews 7, 25. What is the means of overcoming and living lives that fear God and give Him glory? Hebrews 4, beginning at verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathise with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And Hebrews 7.25 Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus, the divine Son of God, has overcome the wiles of the devil. He faced temptations, trusting in the promises of God, surrendering his will to the Father's will and depending on the Father's power. Trusting him, looking to him, believing in him, we too can be victorious. Jesus is our all in all, and the three angels' messages are all about him. Revelation's message is one of victory, not defeat. It speaks of a people who, through his grace and by his power, overcome. The word overcome, in one form or another, is used eleven times in the book of Revelation. In the vision of the seven churches representing the Christian church from the first century to our time, there are believers in every generation who, John says, overcame. At the end time, those who overcome inherit all things, as we read in Revelation 21, verse 7. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. This is not legalism. It is victory through Jesus Christ, whose perfect life of perfect righteousness and that alone is what gives them the promise of eternal life. It is faith in action. It is transforming, life-changing, miraculous grace in the life of the believer. And so to finish today, are there things in your life you desire to overcome? How can we translate our desires into action? What practical steps can we take to become Revelation's overcomers? Friday, April 21. Think about the amazing words of Paul in Hebrews 7.25, which, describing Jesus as our High Priest, says that he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Save to the uttermost? The Greek word for uttermost means full or complete or total. It is Jesus who saves us. Our job is to surrender to him, claiming his victory for us. Our trust must be in him, not in ourselves. Angel Manuel Rodriguez wrote in The Closing of the Cosmic Conflict, The Role of the Three Angels' Messages, an unpublished manuscript, on page 27, he writes, We can summarise the force of the expression fear God in Revelation as God's final call to humanity to choose Him as their glorious and majestic God who will be victorious over the forces of evil that oppose him and his plan for the human race. As we read in Revelation 14, 9 to 11, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. 
He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends for ever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. This fear does not manifest itself, at least not for now, as we read in Revelation 6 verses 14 to 17. And that reads, Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place, and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb." For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So in terror and trembling, but in joyous and loving submission to God's law and to his exclusive worship. No other power should be acknowledged as worthy of such devotion and loyalty. In fact, there are no other options, because what shows itself on the horizon of the cosmic conflict as possibilities are actions of demonic powers destined to extinction, as we read in Revelation 16, verses 13 and 14. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and to the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And Revelation 17 verse 14, these will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. And Revelation 20 verses 11 to 15, then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. The books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and any one not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The fear of the Lord is therefore a positive divine invitation to take God's side in the cosmic conflict in order to stand before his most glorious presence, filled with joy in eternal fellowship with him. End of comment. Except for these verses. Revelation 21, 3 and 4 and Revelation 22, verses 3 to 5. Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4 reads, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And Revelation 22, verses 3 to 5. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp, nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign for ever and ever. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, think about the incredible power of God, the one who created and sustains the entire cosmos. We can barely grasp the idea of the cosmos. How then could we even begin to grasp the creator of it? Think about how much greater and vaster and more powerful he is than we are. And this God will one day judge us. 
How do these facts help us understand the idea of the fear of God and what it means? 2. How can we avoid legalism when we discuss the biblical concepts of holiness, overcoming and victory? Why must we always understand that it was Christ's victory for us at the cross that alone remains the foundation of our hope of salvation regardless of our victories or even failures here and now? And three, why, even with all the promises of victory over sin, do we often find ourselves failing and not living up to the standard of righteousness that Jesus himself modelled for us and promises us could be ours as well. What mistakes are we making in not allowing God to do the work in us that He has promised? And our mission story is read today by Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. Praying for New Friends by Dimitri Begal Elana Begal felt lonely in Kohel, Germany. Born in Siberia, she knew no one when her family arrived, and her German was weak. As the days passed, she missed the life that she had enjoyed in Russia. One day, she cried out to the Lord for a new friend. I really need a friend to spend time with, she prayed. Little did she realize that she was not the only Russian-speaking mother praying for friends. Snezana had moved to the town a year earlier amid difficult family circumstances. On the same day that Alana prayed for a friend, Snezana cried out to God, Lord, I have no more strength. How can I go on living? Help me to meet someone to share my difficulties with. Snezana had two children, ages seven and nine, but they rarely went to the children's playground. On that day, however, they went to the playground. Alana, who had just prayed for a friend, took her baby girl to the same playground. She greeted Snezana in German, but soon she realized that they both spoke Russian. She couldn't believe it. She thought that the mother and children were visiting tourists, but it turned out that they lived in the town and were looking for new friends. Their families have become close friends. God let me meet you so that I would have a friend, Snezana told Alana recently. Alana sends encouraging songs and uplifting sermons to Snezana. She is praying that Susanna will agree to Bible studies. After the meeting, Alana kept praying for new friends. One day, she met Natasha, a Russian speaker in need of encouragement. The women became friends and today, Alana regularly sends Bible promises to Natasha. Alana kept praying for new friends. While shopping, she met Irina, another Russian speaker, and invited her home for a visit. The two women now meet every other week. Sometimes Ilana gives Irina massages, and each time she prays. The last time she gave a massage, Irina prayed for the first time. Ilana has learned that Irina sometimes visited an Adventist church before moving to Kohel. God's ways are wonderful, Ilana said. She prays that Irina will want to study the Bible with her and that she can start a small group for Russian speakers in her home. In the meantime, she keeps praying for new friends. Do you pray for new friends? This mission story illustrates mission objective number one of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan. To revive the concept of worldwide mission and sacrifice for mission as a way of life, involving not only pastors but also every church member, young and old, in the joy of witnessing for Christ and making disciples. For more information, visit IWillGo2020.org. Greetings, Sabbath School friends around the world. My name is Emma Garrick, a final year nursing student at Avondale University in Coorumbong, Australia. You have been listening to my grandfather, Percy Harold, reading the text of the Adult Bible Study Guide with this week's Sabbath School lesson. He has been doing this for free since 1996, long before I was born. Initially read as Eyes for the Visually Impaired through Christian Services for the Blind in Australia and New Zealand. It became a podcast in July 2007, and so became available to anyone around the world. In 2021, Pa's podcast became the reading podcast for the official General Conference Sabbath School app, with daily recordings of each day of the lesson. The podcasts of the reading of the Sabbath School lessons are available from Hope Channel Australia, primarily on SoundCloud, and thence on multiple podcast rebroadcasters, including Apple iTunes. 
For several years, it has also been available in a YouTube format, with the voice of my grandfather syncing in time with the scrolling of the text of the lesson, including all the reference texts. And for the visually impaired in the North American division, it is available on CD from Christian Record Services out of Nebraska. Hope Channel Germany distributes it to the blind in Europe. You are over one of 40,000 who listen every week around the globe. Tell your friends to look up my grandfather on the internet. It is simple. Just search for Dr. Percy Harold, select the site you want to listen to, make it a favorite on your device, and be able to listen again anytime you like. But downloading the General Conference Cyberschool app is a sure way to listen daily. That is the one with the blue rectangular icon, with a stylized globe and three angels superimposed. And, as my grandfather would say each week, remember, God is always faithful.